were using weapons. So you learn how to shoot. You learn how to like, yeah. Uh, yeah. use a bomb, you know, uh, s set people up, flank them, you know, get the high ground, stuff like that. But even in the old days, even if you mm -hmm. think about the old days, the old martial arts in the old days, okay, these magical schools of, of martial arts that people were teaching to, and now you engage in one of those schools and you can spend years refining mm -hmm. some techniques. I mean, people back then didn't have ears to, to learn stuff. That will save their life they will have maybe a week of training two weeks of training yeah but, oh yeah because if the king declared yeah. if the king declared we're going to yeah. war we're going to war oh suit up okay this yeah this, this is a sword this is a spear this is a shield da, 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 da. Yeah. do this do this do this go <laughs> even if it, if it, even if we discount professional warriors that you know exist in, in certain societies you have warrior classes that's that's mm -hmm. of course a necessity in you know pre-modern societies and now we have that translated into professional armies but even if we discount that back then most most war were fought by conscripts to spend 360 years 60 days a year working their land and maybe five days into training for the next battle hoping to come back to their family okay in somehow one piece so if i have to think about how the preparation for fight on a battlefield would go and you know i have two options one is to train three options one is to train martial arts you know traditional martial arts proficiency for years the other one is to train for years in mma uh, i would discard both of them because i think a more accurate description of what is going to happen is in mulan mm -hmm. you travel you get trained Mulan, the movie, the Disney movie, okay? Okay, I haven't watched yeah. it. Huh? Yeah, you go there, you train for a week, and you're ready to fight against the Hun. You ready? No, maybe you'll die. Yes, probably die, but that's what it is. You don't have time to get, uh, to get prepared. Okay, to okay. Go so, so that brings me to, to Krav Maga, because you wrote, a, you, 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 you wrote a book on this, and it's coming out soon, right? Yeah, it's coming out in April 2022. Yeah. Okay, so here's, um, here's my understanding of Krav Maga. So essentially, it's a uh, um, military, um, Israeli military uh, combat, hand-to-hand -hand combat system, so to speak, yeah. which they teach you, like you said, in, in, from, my, from what a friend told me, is that you go in, they teach you that quick, quick, because that's what you need to know to kill people, and that's it. Yeah. it like, you don't actually spend years, like, uh, no. learning it and refining it, and, you know, it's, yeah. it's like... It's, uh, it's, it's a very um, direct and violent approach a very, uh, to, you know, to be able to handle yourself in war type situations. Like it's, it's military. So obviously it is, I mean, in his, in his current incarnation, and then, you know, the, the whole Krav Maga has also evolved into a self-defense system and a martial art. And, you mm -hmm. know, you have this mythological founder, Himri, Him um, Lichenfield, Himi, that created it with his own experience. And so we can go around and um, there's a lot of history about that. Uh, but the way it's taught in the IDF, which is the Israeli Defense Force, is always being taught in the IDF and the Israeli Defense Force is a crash course for recruits. And let's keep in mind that they do have a draft. They do have a compulsory military service, which lasts you know, maybe a few days and is refreshed a few hours uh, you know, during yeah, your old service, the uh -huh. then the, the scope of that is to, first of all, to transition you from a civilian mentality to a military mentality. So you're exposed to risk and you have to react. So you have to kind of boost that aggressiveness, which also we were talking about before the aggressiveness in civilian life. It shouldn't be modeled after that because the scope and the limitation of what you can afford in civilian life is completely different than even the goals. But what is done is there, you know, immediate that sort of reaction and also giving you technique, literally to most of the techniques will boil down into fight, break distance, get your side weapon and finish what you have to do. Because you're supposed that the assumption is that you're going to be armed. The assumption is that you're going to be armed and you're going to be in a team of other people. Okay, so it's not going to be just you defending unarmed from somebody trying to attack you to steal your purse. It's going to be a completely different situation, a completely different scenario. 
So that, that is what is Krav Maga, which mean, literally means empty-handed combat, a hand-to-hand -hand combat within the context of the military where it's taught in Israel. Now, what mm. we see in civilian, it's a transition that was initially made by Imi when he added his service as an instructor within the IDF to create his own business, to create his own thing. That was things that he was good at doing it. Why not making money out of it? Why not teaching out of it to other people? But in mm. order to do that, there has to be made, there are a lot of changes that have to be made. It had to be turned into a martial art. He had to be turned into a curriculum that was extensive enough to be taught over several years. So I'm not just getting your money for a week. And it has to address different scenarios than the military because we're not talking about people in full gear carrying side weapons in a team of other four or five people. But we're talking about people wearing civilian clothes unarmed in a street of Tel Aviv or Netanya or whatever other city. So there's, there's a big transition there that has made. But again, the point that you were making, the military is always different. So mm -hmm. we can't look at the military as a template for what we need to do in civilian life because it's, it's different. It's the, the nature of life, it's and the nature of the encounters are completely different. Yeah, yeah, wow, yeah, that's very insightful. Like I, you know, uh, I really like the, the, the way you explained that. It makes sense now. So essentially the, um, the, the, the instructor, no, not mm -hmm. the instructor, sorry, the founder of, of Krav Maga, he was a, a Krav Maga instructor in the military. Yeah. And then from there, like when he, when he stopped the military, like when he got out, then he, well, he said, oh, I'd like to teach this, you know, to, mm -hmm. uh, to civilians and make a business out of it. So then yeah. he had to switch it up. He had to like build a curriculum where, okay, we're going to learn step one, step two, it's going to take this many years. Uh, okay. We're going to have different scenarios because now we're in, uh, we, yeah. we're going to, we're going to, we're going to like spin it. Uh, we're going to adapt it for self-defense, you know? Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden it's not the same thing anymore. It's not no. what, uh, but was he the founder or was he just an instructor? Like the, the gentleman that so, you spoke well, of? If we're talking about Imi as the founder of Imi. Krav Maga in, in, in what we know as Krav Maga in the gyms that you can go and practice. Oh, yes, see, see. he is the founder of that because that is the system that came out of his own experience out of the military. But if you look at how the system developed in the military, it, it's certainly in depth to what he'd done, mm -hmm. uh, but there were also other people. And it was, you know, the, the, the core of that was there, you know, developed by others also along with him and before him. Uh, mm -hmm. We're talking about the, the British mandate in Palestine. So the, the, this, this person, Imi, is, is, is a European Jew that he, uh, that he experienced anti-Semitism, that he experienced the Nazi regime, he experienced, experienced you know, the, the hunt for Jews in Europe. He organized a neighborhood sort of militia to defend the Jewish community from the incursion of, of uh, the, 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 the zone government, which was allied with, uh, with the German. And, and then, you know, during World War II, it was, a, you know, his father was a policeman. He was taught about a little bit of self-defense and law enforcement. He was a wrestler. He was a boxer. He did judo too at some point. So he, he comes to Palestine. It, it, he moved to Palestine during the time of World War II to escape the situation in Europe. And he started sort of like working with the Haganah, which were the paramilitary organization that defended the Jewish settlement. In, in the area that then turned into be the bedrock of the IDF. So when that change happened, it transitioned into the IDF as a physical activity and self-defense instructor for the new recruit. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of what he did and he developed into the Krav Maga, but he didn't invent the Krav Maga system within the military. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Moshe Feldenkrais was also involved into, into this process, right? Mm -hmm. With his idea of having a natural response. And so Feldenkrais has this, this intuition that uh, human beings are already geared to defend themselves. They have this flinch reaction, the stimuli. And so he studied that at a time where the, the Jewish settlers wanted to defend themselves. And apparently traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu or stick fighting or other things were not as proficient. Mm -hmm. So he was tasked uh, to find 
an adaptation for that to find something that they could be, you know, used to train quickly people and being effective on uh, mostly where like, you know, kind of a mob violence when you have a group of people clashing with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that you couldn't have weapons on them. So that was also a, 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 tap, like a step into the development of the art. Uh, and Himi was involved in that at some point. He instructed that. But Krav Maga, as we know, so the Krav Maga that we know in the military is not his invention. Gotcha. What is gotcha. what he can be credited very, for? Credited for, exactly, is to have created the martial art of Krav Maga. Okay, I see. Not the not the system, yeah. not the military uh, system of Krav Maga yeah. in the military, but the martial art essentially commercialized. Like, yeah, well, it, essentially, yeah, essentially sense. created as a martial art. Like you look at yeah, Kano, for example. Did Kano did the same thing in a certain way? He didn't invent the jujitsu. He took some things from jujitsu and he created exactly, his own system. exactly. But there were also other people involved into that creation process. So that why why you have this continued tension between Kano and Kodokan in Tokyo. And, and, and the Kosen Judo in Hosaka. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of Shadi, talks, sort... the, Shadi yeah. Talk about, talks about that a lot. And I remember having discussions there. With, exactly. Uh... And you have this continuous tension. Okay, you have the Guardian of the Kodokan also. They're involved in the way they developed there and the way they mm-hmm. developed. Why you have uh, you have a lot of you know, Newaza in Kodokan in, uh, in, in, in Kosen, but you don't have a lot of Newaza in, in, um, in Kodokan. That was a choice. Okay, mm-hmm. so judo, kodokan, judo develop in a certain way. Kosen judo develop in another way. Still judo. Mm-hmm. We still recognize Kano being the founder of judo. But it wasn't just his own work. Mm-hmm. 